This is Karen with NuclearLandRadio.net, and it is time for the Intentionality Gurus with Candace Pollock. And if I remember correctly, Candace, today's subject is something about our inner and outer needs, something like that? How our inner game impacts our outer game. Okay, okay. So, so we've, you know, previously talked about um, how our thinking impacts, you know, how we manifest um, activities in our life. You know, our thoughts drive a lot of our emotions and actions and um, for the better or for worse. And if we're not mindful of that dynamic going on, we can get hijacked emotionally and, and otherwise and, and create thinking ruts that kind of keep us stuck in, in place. Right. And... Um, so in this context, we're going to dive a little deeper and explore some of how the hardwiring of our brains, not just as humans, but also how we have helped um, activate certain parts of our brain that impacts how we show up. Okay. All right. So where, where might that be relevant in your life or in the lives of people that um, are listening? Well, <clears throat> I know that when I'm thinking about what I want to do, or where I want to go. I have this image in my head, but it doesn't always coordinate with what I actually end up doing. And what, what do you think drives that? Um, outward forces that, you know, really do hijack me. Um, you know, for instance, yesterday, uh, my husband and I both had a doctor appointment and I said when I got home I was going to call his specialist to make an appointment and I said that and I sat down at my desk and I started to do it and I got an email and I ended up reading it and when I finished reading it it was like I really wasn't sure where what I was going to do when I sat down here. So I started just doing other things. And then when it came up again, um, I, I didn't remember the importance of it. So my brain just was not connecting with everything. Or was so connected. was, was the email triggering emotionally triggering or, or something like that? Um, it was triggering in that it was something that I needed to attend to did i have to attend to it at that moment no but because i opened it and read it i chose to attend to it putting this other stuff on the back burner and then when i put it on the back burner it sort of like faded in my memory what it was all about and then then you came across it again yes or, okay. and when i came across it again that's when i chose you know i really don't have to do this right now and I started doing something else that caught my eye on my desk. <laughs> yeah. So that that's like one of the risks. We have lots of things that are going to catch our attention and so on. And so when you saw it the first time, the email that more or less kind of mentally hijacked you, let's say, and maybe that's too strong of a phrase, um, was there an emotional element to it? Um, only the part of me that says do it now i mean okay and it, and it wasn't urgent i mean i could have attended to this next week and it would have been okay mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. in my brain because i opened it and i read it and was asking for something i felt i had to do it right then okay all right. So some of that can be hardwiring, what we've cultivated. I mean, there's the, the physical structure of the brain and the um, neurotransmitters, you know, the chemicals that get released with certain thoughts or, or other um, sensations, you know, the five senses and so on. And um, then there's the, the, the hardware, the software, so to speak, how we think about it and so on, the stuff that we talk a, a lot about. So the idea behind you know this podcast is just understanding some of those hidden iceberg of things that drive you know how we show up in the world, and which ones serve us and which ones don't. 
So that would be an example of, you know, you, your eyes see the information, you see the email, it's sending signals to the brain, the brain is then processing it. And, um, and I'm, you know, warning here, um, in full disclosure, this is not going to be necessarily the best explanation of some of the neuroscience, you know, the neurobiology and um, physical structure of the brain. Um, but it, for our purposes, it'll be, you know, my version of it, my interpretation of what I, you know, study and I'm interested in and so on. So the idea is, you know, this data comes in, our brain, you know, first is determining, is this a threat or is this okay? All right. And that's going to trigger a certain part in our brain if we have a little ping associated with it um, that uh, sends the alarm that this might be danger. And that happens in, I don't know what a nanosecond actually is, you know, in the whole scheme of things, but that happens like automatically. And that's in the amygdala primarily. All right. And then it takes a while for the same signals, the same data to go to a different part of the brain, um, which is the uh, prefrontal cortex. And to basically say, okay, you know, no danger here. You know, we assessed it. We had a little more time to look at it. No danger here and so on. But if we don't, have the opportunity to, you know, consciously take ourselves to the longer route, because it's going to kick in a, a, just, you know, a few seconds later, but enough that our body has already sent up the signals. And, you know, we've talked about it before that there's a neuroscience concept of um, things that fire together, wire together. So when you have an emotional reaction with a thought um, or a particular behavior, you're, you're actually kind of like welding together those things. And the more you repeat that thought or that reaction um, in, you know, whatever the, the situation is or situations like it, the more you're, you're activating that part. So you're going to be more hair trigger. Does that make sense? Yep. Definitely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But if, if you can cultivate the habit to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It looks scary. So I had something um, actually this morning when I was taking some stuff out um, for, you know, um, garbage day, um, I picked up something, not realizing there was a moth lying on it. It just looked like it was a, a dark spot and it fluttered in my hand. And my immediate reaction was, you know, like that jerk yeah. response. And then I realized, oh, it's just a moth. You know, I have to be careful and not hurt it. And then I, I released it. Um, but that would be a perfect example of, you know, my, my body is hardwired to keep me safe and to alert me to something that might have been, you know, dangerous for me. Um, but my more rational part of my brain um, was able to assess it like, OK, it wasn't really a danger. Got All it. right. So where does that show up in your life? Well, if that had happened to me, uh, I would have truly panicked and I would have been swatting at it and trying to kill it <laughs> and then looking for other you know little creatures that might be around um so you know as I listen to you it's like yeah it's it's a moth is not dangerous okay it's not a big deal but that's not where my brain would have gone but something did interesting did happen in um a scenario similar to this um on saturday for some reason i opened up the bank app um on my phone and i noticed that there were charges on the business account that didn't make any sense in fact they should have been on our home account and i when i saw it I was got very, very upset. I couldn't figure out what to do. My husband says to me, just call the bank. I couldn't find the phone number for the bank and it was staring me right in the face. But to me, it was danger because I was going to overdraft the account, but these bills were being paid out of the wrong account. And so it took me a half hour to calm myself down before mm -hmm. I could actually make the phone call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's another part of the brain called the hippocampus. And, you know, from my reading and study, they liken it to a break. So when the amygdala gets triggered and it kind of stays triggered and it takes a little while for the body 
um, processes to calm down, you know, maybe not just in those nanoseconds, but sometimes we can still get, you know, the, the thought loop can continue to trigger it. The hippocampus is, you know, puts the brake on. But if we um, have, to, if we get caught up in that loop too often, the hippocampus actually starts to atrophy. So it can't put the damper on. Right, it's kind of like brakes that start to lose their grip on the um, whatever in, in the wheel, and um, this is how scientific I am with you know like whatever that is in in the wheel <laughs> where they you know the, those little clamps like slow it down right. Well, right. it loses some of its its power, and uh, it's, I don't as far as I know we don't lose the hippocampus, but it just means we stay more reactive. We we are actually training our brain to be more reactive. And so we're more likely then to have those spikes of, you know, avoidance or fear or um, whatever, the, the emotions that are going to be reinforcing the habits that might keep us in a, an anxiety state. Okay. Yep. So, but we can be aware of this. This is one of those classic forks in the road, just knowing, okay, there it goes again. Um, I had that reaction. And, you know, I, in fact, I did that automatically with the moth this morning. And um, it, it just, you know, I've been working hard at, at not triggering that um, anxiety part of the brain. One might even say, maybe I'm a little anxious about triggering that anxiety part of the brain, but I'm, that's I'm kind of an exaggeration. Right. So the thing I'm fascinated about is, you know, we have two tendencies as humans. There are state-oriented individuals and there are um, basically uh, action-oriented uh, individuals. It's, it's kind of our natural state. So you probably know, you probably have um, some of these qualities where in some situations you um, pause and you don't really want to take action. And in others, you know, okay, you just take action. Right. Right. And is, do you notice any pattern to that? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm more of the take action than, you know, let it go. Um, and I've always been like that. I always feel like everything has to be taken care of right now. So, so where can that actually be, um, something that undermines you? Um, in most cases, it's not good for me because I react in the wrong way, meaning I don't take care of the situation in a either a timely fashion or an appropriate fashion. Okay. And then what what do you think your brain makes of that when when that phenomena occurs? You know, you're not alone in that. I mean, right. most of us have those those um experiences. So it used to be my brain would just keep telling me, you know, that I was stupid, I was wrong. Now what I hear is, okay, slow down, do it a different way. Doesn't mean I'm really slowing down, but that's what I'm hearing. It's like, you you can, you can got this, you can do this. Um, whereas in the past, it was like, you know, you're never going to get this right. So the fork in the road is appearing for you, it sounds like. Right, yes. Okay. And then you can make a conscious decision. And right. one of the decisions may be, okay, this needs to be attended to, but not this moment. Exactly. Okay. So in the studies they've done about steady state people, you know, the uh, state oriented people and the action oriented people, their, their brains actually fire different, not fired differently. It may be not an accurate, but some areas of the brain are activated more easily than others in part because of brain training. Part of it is going to be like just kind of how we're born, maybe like we're right-handed or left-handed, you know, whatever um, creates that. But with people who are not likely to take action, um, they, they their amygdala was um, actually larger. The, the, the reactive part, the fight, flight, or flee part of the brain that's supposed to keep us safe, it's the really primitive part of the brain. Um, then it, it's it's more robust, so to speak, um, than the action-oriented people. So it's it's the part of the brain that processes fear, and um, it's always looking for risk. And it's you know that's that's a good thing, right? Um, unless we do it to a fault. 
and and unless it undermines our our life now maybe if i were i don't know um an ems person and so on i need to be in that hyper alert um anticipating everything that could go wrong situation um but in other situations at home, you know, with family and so on, maybe I don't need that level and maybe it actually impairs some of the, the interactions and so on. Whereas the action oriented um, people tend to have the part of the brain that, um, and, and I'll tell you what it is. So it's the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. I don't know if you need to know all of that, but basically it's involved in decision-making. So it is more likely to go to, okay, I'm gonna you know, do an action. It may not be this moment, but I'm gonna decide how I'm going to decide or how I'm going to act. And the amygdala is not as, you know, certainly it may be triggered, but hanging out there, staying there in that hyper um, alert, anxious, um, fear oriented status is, is not gonna be as long as the this, this state oriented. So for state oriented people, they, they're more likely to say, I need to feel like doing this. Where action-oriented people, they're just skipping over the, you know, regardless of how they feel, they're just going to do it. So I saw you roll your eyes. Well, what did that mean? Because my husband is the one who, if something happens, it's typically, I'll get to it when I get to it. And me, it's like, oh my God, we got to get to this. Um, we were working out in the garage the other day because we were thinking about redoing the shelving in there and a box started to lean off the shelf. Now it didn't fall, but it was coming towards the end. And I jumped forward with my bad arm to hold it up. Hmm. My husband just stood there and he goes, what are you doing? You know, even if it fell, it's not a big deal, but it wasn't going to fall. But I see it differently than he does. And 99% of the time on anything, it's like that. It's like, oh, it's okay. And I'm going like, no, it's got to be fixed. So then how, how does that show up in your life in terms of your sense of well-being and, um, you know, equanimity, having, having some kind of, you know, calm and whatever in life, in business and personal? Um, I'm learning very slowly that even though I feel like something has to be done right now, there are quite a few things that I'm able to sort of step back and analyze it and determine when it really has to get done. But I still am, you know, triggered by things that I see and I guess the word is danger. I mean, like the box falling off, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I don't even know what's in the box, but if it falls and if it's, you know, breakable, you know, we've lost what's ever in there. Or with the bank account, yes, there was money in the bank account for what went through, but now it was like, oh my God, what else is gonna happen? And if I don't take care of this now, there's gonna be a problem. Um, and those just like wear on me. It just, it takes a lot of energy for me to get through through fixing those things. Yeah, so thank you. That's like a perfect example of how um, that dynamic, you know, there's nothing right or wrong about it. We're just observing it. That dynamic is um, keeping you kind of in the alert, um, you know, fear-oriented stage. Um, and then it kind of feeds on itself. It's self-propelling. All right. So, and, and what the science shows, the neuroscience shows is that state oriented people um, have a hard time initiating a task, you know, because they, there's still fear there, you know, it's like breathing polluted air, you know, it, it, it's kind of permeates um, all that brain chemistry. And it's, we can invoke our conscious thoughts to overcome it and do some practices to overcome it. But that does require a commitment to at least finding the fork in the road and, and making that decision to do it. But then the neuroscience shows that that um, part of the, the brain in the uh, prefrontal cortex um, doesn't have as much 
strength over that fear part. So the, the fear part stays stronger and it just feeds itself. And the other part, unlike in action oriented people can regulate that, can, can overcome it, can put the brake on in essence and say it, it isn't really a danger. So some of the things um, that they suggest in terms of this, this whole stuff comes up in the context of procrastination. So people who are procrastinators tend to be steady state or state oriented people um, and people who are action oriented. You know, we, everybody has some procrastination on right. some things, um, but it's, it's not as, um, I don't know if I want to use the word debilitating, but it, it's not as much of a factor. It seems like in normal proportions where some people are, you know, it's just very difficult to take any action on, on many, many things. So the idea is to um, create tiny, tiny little steps that you know that almost you could not succeed at, you know, that you would succeed at. So because then what you're doing is you're teaching the brain chemically, neurotransmitter wise, the chem brain chemistry that, OK, in these situations, I can overcome the fear. And then that that starts to strengthen the part of the brain that is putting the damper on the on the immediate you know reaction now i don't know if that applies to like having a, a, this little f fluttery moth in your hand you know and then suddenly realizing oh like there's something live in my hand um i don't think all my um thinking habits might overcome that um, because that's a more of a primal reaction physical reaction but in other contexts where do you think that might show up for you that you well, knowing you know, that could be yeah. beneficial. So I'm going to go back to the bank issue. Um, here I was, I found it. My first reaction was, oh, it's got to be resolved. It's got to be resolved right now. What do I do? And I kept saying over and over again to my husband, what do I do? What do I do? I don't see it in the bank app where I can change anything. And he said, call the bank. And again, I went online and I just wasn't seeing the phone number for the bank. And I finally, you know, like yelling and screaming at him, you got to come here, you got to help me find the phone number, whatever. Um, and he was in the middle of something, but he came and I found the phone number. And it was once I made that phone call, I was able to breathe and explain what had happened and listen very intently to the person on the other end, how we could resolve it, which was very easy. It was just transferring the money from one account to the other to make sure that everything got paid like it was supposed to. Um, but I could not think in the beginning. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. once, but once I heard the person on the phone and I knew I have to explain this, I have to be coherent and once I did that, and then getting their response, it was like, oh, you know, like I am okay. And now yeah, I know. So, so that, that, that rational part of the brain came online. It yes. just was taking a little while to come online, like a blinking cursor or the spooling uh, cursor that, you know, yep. it, it was the amygdala has had um, a lot of practice triggering. And that part of the brain uh, in certain situations takes a little longer to come online. That's a perfect example. And I also find that I, and I'm going to call it overreact, but I overreact like this when my husband is around. If I was home alone and found this out, I don't react in the same way. I don't so what do you think that's about? Part of it, I do believe, is like, I just want him to fix it because he's here. <laughs> you know? Take this moth. Yes. Yeah. Take it out of my hand. Right. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, and yet when he's not here, I know that it's totally on me. And so I just go ahead and I do it. You know, I may have those internal, you know, issues where, you know, my, I feel my heart palpitating and, you know, I'm getting nervous and whatever but I figure out a way to do it without yelling and screaming and, you know, feeling like I'm the stupidest person in the world. But when he's around, it's like, I'm in my head, it's like, 
why won't you fix this for me? <laughs> you know, and I should know better. We've been together 40 years. And part of the reason he doesn't is he wants me to see what I really am capable of doing. Um, and usually, as he says, I'm more capable than he is. So, and I think he's well, right. that's convenient. Yeah. But actually, in a lot of cases, it's, it's true. You know, mm -hmm. because he doesn't think logically like when I allow myself to, to get things done. So he, that's why he procrastinates because he'll say, my brain just isn't there yet. So, mm -hmm. and he's on the spectrum. So I have to give him a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's processing but, things differently. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, so, you know, no, hearing yourself say some of these things, what occurs to you like going forward in terms of like the, the state oriented versus the action oriented and, and how one part of the brain is triggered and gets better at triggering because the other dynamics are uh, one part atrophies and another part just doesn't come online uh, as quickly. You know, I think it's really important at least for me to, you know, try to be mindful about what's happening at the time. Um, and again, not, you know, as we pointed out, not everything is um, life-threatening. In fact, most of the things that I go through are not life-threatening at all. They all can be corrected. And so it's almost like I have to keep telling myself, that it's going to be okay um, mm -hmm. to keep myself calm and to keep myself focused. Yeah. And, and strengthening that part of the brain so right. that that amygdala part, that primitive, you know, trying to just do its job and protect us. Um, and it's, you know, it's going to be not even hair trigger. It's going to be invoked in less than a hair trigger um, and so on. So, you know, the, the reason I wanted to share this is because I think for me, just understanding how, you know, as mammals, we're hardwired. And, you know, yes, we can overcome a lot of our thinking habits and so on, but also understanding that um, we don't have to swim against the current in terms of how we're hardwired. And we can, um, un you know, maybe be a little more forgiving towards ourselves in terms of, okay, you know, your little wiggly thing in your hand that you weren't expecting. <laughs> Um, yeah, it is a little triggering, um, but yet um, it's not life threatening. And and to be able to put things in proportion and make that decision, how am I going to react? I, I remember my husband used to. Um, he was never critical, but he was would get frustrated with me if I thought I saw a mouse and I would shriek. I'm not really afraid of mice. I mean, we had hamsters, we had all sorts of creatures when I was growing up. But there's just something about the the furtive movement. And I, you know, it's on some primitive level. Yeah. All right. But what can I say? Um, and he would say, you know, why, why do you have to shriek? And I said, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, now I have a better understanding. Oh, it's just, you know, how we're hardwired as, as humans. Um, but I love the idea that um, for you to see that concept that when Rich is around, um, the behavior is a little different. Oh. And that would be really fun to, to look into. And the funny part is, is that for years, I, you know, he would say that to me, like, you know, why, why do you know how to fix a door that's off the hinge when I'm not home? But when I'm home, you have no idea and you want me to do it. And it never dawned on me that, you know, I, I was leaving things for him to do because like I wanted him to do it. And I guess that was more more of what it was and I didn't think I could do those things and now that you know I can do certain things um it's like it's rewarding but not so rewarding when he's around and I've got to get over <laughs> more rewarding when he does it well I had a similar experience when I went through a divorce um with my first husband and um so he was out of the house and so on and I was doing some um, I was making a frame for a quilt I had made and he normally would have done that for me. And he was, he was very capable at doing those things. And I remember I had a moment where I thought, 
I can't do this. I'm going to have to find somebody to do it for me. It was almost like I was invoking some helplessness or something. I wasn't fully aware of that at the time, but I did catch myself thinking, um, well, who says I can't do it? You know, and, and, you know, I ended up not doing a perfect job. It, it definitely looked like maybe a third graders attempt. Um, but um, it, at least I was able to overcome that sense of, ooh, something's not right here. You know, am I up to doing it? Because I think it's that vulnerability thing, again, getting triggered. You know, the, all these things that I used to rely on him to do. So, all right. So your main takeaway for um, people that are listening? Well, I think it's just to be really aware, as we've talked about in so many of the other shows, our reactions and our behaviors to things. Um, you know, we can make we can make choices, and uh, if we can make a choice that is better for us physically and mentally, um, you know, that's probably the choice that we should be taking. Mm -hmm. and and be forgiving towards ourselves in terms Absolutely. of some of it is hardwired and it just means being you know extra conscious about that process and not beating ourselves up because we can't overcome certain thinking habits and those kinds of things so sounds good well we will be back in a couple of weeks and with that i want to thank you and i'm going to be more mindful of how i am next week when i'm away from my husband for a week so should oh, be. that'll be fun. That'll be a yep. nice experiment. Your your little citizen scientist experiment. Cool. Got it. Okay. Take All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.